STEM. It stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. Let's face it, they are the building blocks of modern innovation. These fields remain a man's world. Fewer and fewer young women are choosing to pursue STEM careers. That's a detriment to scientific discovery and technological breakthroughs. This week, we'll meet women who are determined to change this trend once and for all. I'm Mike Walter in Los Angeles. Let's take it full frame. <laughs> American astronaut Tracy Caldwell Dyson is no stranger to challenges. Despite struggling with math in school, she went on to earn a PhD in chemistry from the University of California. She joined NASA as an astronaut in 1998. In 2007, she became one of only 57 women who have gone into space. And Tracy Caldwell Dyson served aboard the International Space Station for 176 days in 2010. She completed three spacewalks and logged more than 22 hours of extravehicular activity performing repairs on a malfunctioning coolant pump. Hello, Tracy, it's your husband. <laughs> I wanted to let you know that you look beautiful and with your grin from ear to ear, it looks like you're happy to be back in your, uh, in your home. Enjoy your time up there and I'll be talking to you soon. I love you. <laughs> when the darkness has a hunger that's insatiable and the lightness has a call that's hard to hear And I'll wrap my fear around me like a blanket I sailed my ship to safety till I sank it I'm crawling on your shores Astronaut Tracy Caldwell Dyson joins us now from Houston, Texas to share her thoughts on inspiring young women to have the self-confidence to pursue their dreams. We want to welcome you to Full Frame. Tracy, uh, it's so great to have you on the broadcast. Let me ask you this. Uh, I know you've talked a lot about uh, your childhood and working with your dad and how, in many respects, that, those were the, the building blocks to become an astronaut. Talk to us about how important it was to be a part of that, uh, that team working with your dad. Oh, it, it's hard to put that in a nutshell, Mike. My, my dad, both my mom and dad were quite a team when it came to raising me and my sister. I think the key phrase I heard growing up was can't never could. My mom simply wouldn't hear of uh, that word coming out of my mouth. It was always I can. And then my dad being on the job with him at such a young age, I was seven when I first remember uh, going to work with him and actually having a tool in my hand. And I got to watch my father for several years, uh, if not decades, uh, solve problems and uh, witness it firsthand and then him running me through the steps of how you critically think about a problem and, and come up with solutions. And those two things combined, I think, really put me off to a good start. Well, I'm just thinking, uh, you know, I've heard you talk about this. I'm thinking a malfunctioning coolant pump, you were probably like, yeah, I probably did that a million times on the, on the earth. Why not? I'll take a stab <laughs> at it. I mean, it's great yeah. to have that kind of approach. Yeah, you know, it was it's simply uh, the, the, the malfunction itself was uh, all my astronaut training kicked in on board inside the space station when that happened. But once we were outside in our uh, pressurized suits with our tools in our hands, and uh, working real time with mission control, because this was the first time that we had a, an unplanned contingency uh, uh, problem on board the space station. So we were having to uh, think on our feet uh, along with the ground. And so that part actually did feel quite natural. Tracy, um, so many young kids, boys and girls, uh, dream of being an astronaut, dream of being president of the United States. They've actually done studies where girls have that dream up to a certain age and then they recognize it's just not going to happen. And, and I suspect there are a lot of girls who think, well, I'm not going to become an astronaut. It's kind of a man's profession. So what separates you from the others? How were you able to take that dream and make it a passion and make it a reality? Again, Mike, I think I have to credit my parents. I never once heard from either one of them that girls don't do that. And neither my sister nor I ever had boundaries set upon us. In fact, 
I was never, I never remember being called a tomboy until I actually got to be in high school and heard it from other kids. So my parents made it quite n normal for my sister and I to pursue the kinds of things that we enjoy doing. And some of those things included uh, repairing uh, cars, uh, playing baseball. Uh, it, 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 there, I was working for my father as an electrician. My sister was a gas station attendant back in those days when uh, you actually had someone else pumping your gas for you. So these things and, and pursuing science was never something that I was told, um, you know, girls just don't do that. So it just felt very natural uh, for me to, to step into some of these roles and I had the full support of the most important people of, in my life. You can't ignore the statistics, though, and uh, the First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama, recently said we got to get all hands on deck. The, the fact of the matter is, when it comes to STEM fields, uh, women, girls, very much underrepresented. How do we change that? You know, I think that it, girls and boys alike, I think the emphasis has to be less on STEM and more on curiosity, because that is really the genesis of what it takes to to, to be a member of those fields. STEM is just science, technology, engineering, and math are the applications of curiosity. And I think when we, when we lay that term out there, STEM, or even you know, break it into its components of science, technology, et cetera, we, we scare off kids because I didn't grow up thinking I could be a scientist, but I asked a lot of questions and I was told I was curious and I, and I knew I was curious. We tell kids that what it takes is curiosity uh, and that's something that you are. It's, it's not something you learn in school. It's just a part of your being. So I think that if we encouraged kids, girls and boys alike, to just explore that curiosity, to harness that curiosity and apply it, then I think we'll find our kids in those fields because that's the field which we, in which we apply our curiosity. Okay, so cu curiosity is important, there's no doubt about it, but desire also has to be a key component. And I imagine there must have been some stumbling blocks along the way, and that's what got you to where you are today, wouldn't you agree? Oh, sure, yeah, and as you mentioned, math was, was one of my largest stumbling blocks, and part of that was a confidence thing. And um, once I started to realize I just needed to ask the questions, get, get it out there, and expose, you know, my... Um, ignorant, so to speak, uh, that it was okay to ask these questions. Then I started to get the instruction that I needed. And once, once I started to see math in a different light, then it started to make more sense to me. So I think that when um, kids are going through school, th there's this, this tendency to want to um, hide what you don't know. Instead, we need to encourage, kids need to be more encouraged to, to ask those questions and be more vulnerable so that they can learn, because that's how we learn. What is that moment like when you're selected to go to space, go out into space? Uh, well, so when you're selected for a mission, uh, it is uh, very exhilarating. Uh, it's a culmination of a lot of years of hard work. And uh, you, you look forward to putting into practice all the things that you've learned over the years. Tracy, we've seen this image over and over again, uh, the astronauts suited up, making that walk, um, also being strapped in. Uh, walk us through the moments. What's it like uh, walking uh, with your colleagues, uh, everybody looking at you, then getting in? What's the launch like? What's the coolest part? What's the scary part? Uh, most of us will never get this experience. So, so put us in the chair for just a few minutes, if you will. Oh. Well, that was a that was a long menu there. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of emotions. Of I mean, as you mentioned, uh, you know, we get suited up on the on the uh, uh, when you're walking out to the launch pad together uh, with your crewmates. It, it is a uh, a moment of uh, of pride and excitement because you're a team and you've been training for uh, about a year together, uh, to, and you're finally getting to execute this mission. And you, it's not lost on you, the, the magnitude of what you're doing and the risk that you're taking. Uh, and your family's involved and your family's excited and there's, there's a combination of, of nervousness and, and excitement that is, is so unique and, it, and it's a very uh, strong bonding moment between you and your crewmates as you walk out. And then when you're, when you're actually up in space, 
at least for my first time there, uh, you just have no idea. Every step of the way is new for you. Every single minute of the mission is brand new for you. And you're wondering, how are you going to react? Are you going to be able to keep up? Are you going to be able to do your job? Um, you know, physiologically, your body um, responds when you get to orbit uh, differently than um, how you are on Earth. So you've got that to worry about. And um, the timeline on a shuttle flight is very fast paced. There was all sorts of activities going on at once and it was very ambitious, the timeline. So of course you had that kind of stress. But then once you get up there, everything starts to flow in its place and then you have those touching personal moments with your crewmates. Uh, I, I had the, the blessing of celebrating my birthday uh, on both of my missions. And on one of my birthday, on my shuttle flight, one of my crewmates, the, the pilot, Charlie Hobaugh, took a brownie that he got, that he had packed away for his, one of his meals, and he took a mini mag light, unscrewed the top of it so there was just the bulb sticking out, and he crammed it inside of his brownie and he floated it at me and sung me happy birthday. <laughs> and I mean, where else in, in, your, in your life are you ever going to get a brownie floated to you uh, on your birthday? It was, and so it was just a real touching moment to bring me back to Earth, say, oh, today's my birthday and I can't believe I'm in space. Um, so, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but one of the most uh, uh, memorable, striking moments for me uh, on my shuttle mission was the first opportunity that I had to look out that window. And my commander at that time, Scott Kelly, uh, he had three rookies on his flight. And he called down to mission control and he said, I want all the external lights turned off of the space station. And this was at a time during our uh, mission where we had uh, a rest period. And he stuck the three of us in the windows of the space shuttle and he said, all right, you three, I want you to sit here and just look out the window for a complete orbit. And that's all I want you to do. Wow. And he, he had to generate that pause for us because the timeline was so uh, tight and busy that he knew we weren't going to be able to take that time for ourselves. And so it was great leadership on his part. And he got us in that window and it was one of the most magnificent things I've ever seen in my life. To see the stars, um, you know, they're, they're not twinkling when you're above the atmosphere. There's no light being diffracted. And so they're just a solid, steady light. It's very piercing. But then as, you're, as your eyes begin to settle on it, you start to realize that there's actually a third dimension out there. Um, it's not this two-dimensional space that we all see here uh, where each star looks like it's right next to the other one. You actually can detect the depth uh, of space between those stars. And, and then when you realize that you're actually seeing the difference in light years. It's, it's very astounding. And then to realize that you're one of, um, you know, you're, you're a part of a tiny fraction of the human race to ever get to see the Earth from that vantage point is, um, is a very powerful thought and it well, sticks with you forever. Well, you did take us there, so I appreciate it. And one other thing I'm gonna point out every birthday party from now on this stinks it just doesn't measure up but there's no way to compete with that right <laughs> heck yeah <laughs> exactly let, let me ask you about this it's like top that <laughs> <laughs> you just can't I, I, no one's going to even try uh let me ask you about this because i think it's really interesting uh, you were the first astronaut to use sign language uh, in a mission why did you feel the need to do that and how important was that for you it was very important to me and um, it goes back to when I was in graduate school. I had learned sign language uh, back when I was in high school. I, I had friends that I went to school with that were deaf. So I picked it up there. I took classes when I was in college. So when I got to graduate school um, in the chemistry department there, they knew that, I'd learned, that I knew sign language. In fact, one of my, one of my classmates who was teaching a, a laboratory course um, had a student in his class that was deaf and he said that she was struggling uh, she's a bright person but she was just struggling keeping up with the material and he asked if I could talk to her so long story short is I not only talked to her but I became her tutor and I went with her to um, her class to see just what kind of problems she was having and it was very um, uh, discouraging to me to see here's this really bright person sitting in a classroom and her eyes have to be for, for the lack of hearing she has to be looking at her at her desk at her notes she has to be looking at an interpreter and watching the professor and then seeing what he writes on the board and she only has two sets of eyes, you know, two eyes and 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 so it real it made me realize just how challenging it is uh, for a student uh, just to make it in a in a 
in a hearing world. And from that point forward, I really just had a, um, uh, an appreciation for the, for the extra effort that uh, the deaf community has to put into their daily life just to fit into this hearing world. So when I got to the space station, I found that it was, it was a, uh, an opportunity for me to share the space station in a language that would reach out to that community and get them interested in the space program and let them know that this is their space program too, that um, there is a place for them here. Have, do you think there's ever going to be a day where we might see a hearing impaired astronaut? And, and I also want to ask on top of that, uh, what's been the reaction from the hearing impaired community? Because I'm sure a lot of them really respect the fact that you did that. Yeah, they were very excited. In fact, I teamed up with uh, a school, a local school here in Austin called the Texas uh, School for the Deaf. And uh, they took the video that I made of the tour in sign language, and then they set it to questions and, and produced something pretty cool. So yeah, the, the rea reaction was pretty cool. And, and, uh, and then uh, folks that I know um, who have uh, uh, just hearing, you know, fully capable hearing uh, uh, kids, they're going off into college and majoring in sign language. And so it's been uh, a delight to hear about how it's uh, motivated some. Hearing impaired astronaut, you think we'll ever see that? Oh, you know, I've thought about this. And I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility, but, but today's missions rely heavily on communications, verbal and and hearing because we can't always be face to face with those that we're talking to even even on our crew um, but certainly between um, the crew on orbit and the mission control team on the ground or, or wherever they would be based if we're talking um, future exploration missions so right now the paradigm would it would make it uh, challenging uh, for a hearing impaired person to be able to perform uh, by today's mission standards but I don't think that 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 um, is necessarily to preclude, you know, involving them. I think that um, it, there, there's a lot of bright, there's just as many bright, talented people um, in the deaf community that could contribute to the space program and being an astronaut that I think it would be worth, um, especially as we go further um, uh, into space exploration, that we're going to need uh, talent, whether they can hear or not. I'm going to key off a couple of words you just said, uh, go further in, in space exploration. It seems to a lot of people that NASA is kind of stuck in neutral. Where does NASA go in the future? Uh, do you think the future is bright for NASA? I do, yes. Uh, neutral, no. We are, um, we are full throttle. Uh, we've been flying the space station uh, continuously uh, for uh, 15, over 15 years. And we've had a continuous human presence since the year 2000. So we, um, and we are continuing to do that today. Are we launching uh, crews from uh, American soil today? No. Uh, but we are definitely alive in the space program and NASA is busy at work. In December, we should be uh, launching our first uh, mission, our test mission of our new Orion capsule and uh, our space launch system. And that is going to begin uh, the trek for uh, launching humans again from American soil. So NASA's busy. We've got our commercial partners uh, involved, and everybody's trying to get uh, launches back in the United States. So I think we just. Uh, have, remain patient for a little bit and uh, we'll start to hear more about uh, uh, launches and, and the space program uh, launching from U.S. soil uh, here in the near future. Okay, Tracy, we're just about out of time, so quickly on this one. I know you're also in a rock band that you sing with other astronauts, so which one makes you more nervous, going out into space or stepping up on stage and belting out a tune? D definitely the latter. I. Um, it took me years as a member of Max Q, uh, the all astronaut band, to actually have my eyes open while I was singing and to acknowledge, yes, indeed, there are there is an audience. So give me a rocket any day. Give me a microphone and an audience, and I've got to really do some self-talk. Amazing woman. She's all about rockets and rock. Uh, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much for visiting with us. Thanks a lot, Mike. When we come back, what more can be done to engage girls in STEM education from an early age? Our next guest has found an innovative answer.